kingdom of God works. When we talk about the kingdom of God and its strength and its might and its majesty and all of the things associated with the kingdom of God, we tend to, dare I say, Americanize the gospel, where might makes right. We tend to, to think that that strength is power and a show of force, but in the kingdom of God, this upside-down kingdom, strength is exactly the opposite of that. Strength is weakness. Strength is a measure of, of, of weakness restrained, even in Christ, even in God, um, made flesh in Christ. We don't see power and might the way that we think of power and might. We see power and might restrained into profound weakness that becomes a profound strength. This is the way the kingdom of God works. And I bring this up because today we're talking about this concept of humility. I don't know. Um, someone asked me earlier if I was ready for the day, and I said, no, I'm never ready for the day until about 1 o'clock Sunday afternoon. And uh, I said, but I've got a great sermon on humility. <laughs> of course, I was, it was a joke. I never know if it's a good sermon until I'm done with it. But, but, but this, is, this is one of these marks of the kingdom of God, and this is what we've been looking at. We started last week. What are these characteristics of the kingdom of God? Last week, we started off by talking about obedience. Obedience is the first characteristic of the kingdom of God. This week, we're dealing with this concept of humility as a characteristic of the kingdom of God. But the question is, why talk about the kingdom of God? Don't we come to church to get to heaven? Isn't that what this is about? Actually, do you know Jesus' message, his number one message, no, his only message that he ever preached was the kingdom of God. Of God. Think about it. Think of the parables you've heard in, in maybe in Sunday school, maybe growing up, maybe um, maybe online forums, wherever you've heard them. You know, the, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like leaven. The kingdom of God is like um, the, uh, the, the father whose son, the prodigal son whose, whose son went off and came back and, and was welcomed. This is what the kingdom of God is like. Jesus prefaced all of his teaching, all of it, with this construct of the kingdom of God. In fact, at one point, um, the, he makes a comment. He says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. He was talking about himself. You see, we sometimes think that the kingdom of God is the pearly gates, the, uh, the, uh, the streets of gold, the heavenly choir. I think we've got some of that here this morning. And we're waiting for the kingdom of God way out there, but God taught us to pray in Jesus, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so when we talk about characteristics of the kingdom of God, we are talking about that central message of Jesus. Um, I, I was reading this from Matthew 18 earlier this week. It says, at, this at that time, Jesus' disciples came to him and they said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Heaven. Now I'm reading from Matthew. Matthew means kingdom of God, but he always says kingdom of heaven instead. So it's the same, it's the same phrase, but the disciples came and they want to know who's the greatest, right? Do you know the disciples sometimes had problems with humility? Uh, kind of like us. I don't think I've ever met a humble person. I've met people who are becoming humble. <laughs> We're always becoming humble. Um, if you have arrived, you certainly better not tell me because then you will have lost your footing uh, in, in humility. But the disciples came to him and said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to himself a child, Jesus put the child in the midst of them, right in the center of them, and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like a child, become like a child such as these, childlike, not childish. <laughs> There's a difference. If you want to know the difference, uh, just hang around for a few weeks, and I'm a great example. Um, but I say to you, unless you turn and become like a child, childlike, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Whoever humbles himself like this child is greatest 
in the kingdom of God. Isn't that interesting? Humility is the characteristic of greatness in the kingdom of God. Isn't it amazing how even in the church we collect titles for ourselves? We collect, we collect degrees for ourselves. Oof, that hits home. Uh, we, collect, we collect reputations for ourselves. We collect all of these things. And he says the ones who are greatest in the kingdom of God are those who are humble. The kingdom of God that has arrived with Jesus' life and ministry and is coming in fullness at his return is the singular message of Jesus. We've got to get this. This is why we're talking about the kingdom of God. God. And so uh, I propose that these central characteristics begin and end, not just in the message of Jesus, but in Jesus himself. What does the kingdom of God look like? It looks like Jesus. What do kingdom citizens look like? They look like Jesus. What are the characteristics of those that belong to the kingdom of God? They're characteristics that exemplify the life and the ministry of Jesus. So understand, the kingdom of God is a present reality. A present right now reality. I'm well aware of the fact that that reality is not yet complete but it is present. Christ said so. And and so the idea is that we exhibit the characteristics that belong to the kingdom of God if indeed we belong to the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. So this is kind of the central tenet. Now, in order to understand this, the way we've been coming at it, we began with this last week, is we're going back not just to Jesus' words, but we're going back to the foundation of Israel as a nation. Because I believe that these characteristics that belong to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, are also characteristics that God implemented from the beginning. That God wasn't waiting for obedience until Jesus came. Uh, God wasn't waiting for uh, people to be humble until Jesus showed us what humility looked like. He, of course, is our exemplar. And by his spirit, he becomes our enabler to become these things. But I believe from the beginning, these are characteristics that God has designed for his kingdom. And so we've gone back to the beginning of Israel as a kingdom. Uh, this, this kind of burgeoning kingdom, the birth of the nation, as it were. So we're, we're going to be walking through these next few weeks, the books of First and Second Samuel, as we see the emergence of Israel on the national stage with their kings and their policies and their wars and all of the things that characterize who they are. So we've gone back to understand what God's kingdom looks like on earth and what God's kingdom citizens look like. Do you know, maybe this needs said um, again as a good reminder for us, but do you know, grace does not take away the fact that what we do still matters. What we do still matters. Grace does not excuse bad behavior. Grace is the power of God that saves us no matter where our behavior has taken us. Grace is the power of God that sustains us when we have been called into his kingdom. And grace is the power of God that will lead us to that fullness. It is all grace, but grace is not an excuse for bad behavior. You're like, why are we talking about things like obedience and humility and perseverance? We'll be talking about that in the weeks to come and all of these characteristics. Grace should should mean that we don't have to talk about these things. And actually, the opposite is true. Grace means that the power of Christ through his spirit is enabling us to become these characteristics that define the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So we go back uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'd invite you, if you have your Bibles or phone apps or whatever whatever floats your boat this morning, turn to um, 1 Samuel chapter 16. But let me give you some background. Last week we dealt with um, the, the judge of Israel, one of the last judges. Some call him a prophet, certainly that's the case, but one of the last judges of Israel named Samuel. Samuel, of course, is the namesake for 
the books, 1st and 2nd Samuel. Um, and we learn the story of Samuel's calling as a young child. God called him as a child didn't wait until he had a profession of faith, didn't wait until he had been baptized or whatever happened. God called a child, and God still calls children. God still calls children of all ages, even 95-year-old children. My grandmother was in her mid to late 70s when she finally came to faith. God still calls at all ages. And this was the story. It was a story of Samuel's obedience. But the story gets hard after that, honestly. The, the next few chapters, the 12 or so chapters that lead us all the way up into our text for today, uh, remind us of how quickly obedience turns into disobedience. You see, here's, here's the nation of Israel, and God's plan for them had been that God himself would be their king, that they would have these judges, these prophets, who would speak the words of God, but would not be political leaders. They wouldn't be uh, accumulating armies for a nation. They wouldn't be lording power. They wouldn't be collecting taxes. Wouldn't that be amazing? They wouldn't be doing these things. Uh, they were going to live by the precepts of God. Uh, God's desire for them was not a monarchy. God's desire for them was what we call a theocracy, where God himself was in charge. God reigns. God is in charge. This was God's plan. But the people looked around, the nations around them, and they saw everyone else had a king. Well, if everyone else has a king, we want a king. And what's disturbing, maybe even frightening to me, is that God said, okay. You ever thought about that? How often in our lives do we long for a lesser good than what God desires for us? And God says, boy, it's not my plan for you, but your insistence, have your way. Have your way. Um, and so God allowed them to do this. And, and Samuel was part of this process. Um, God led Samuel to a man by the name of Saul. I love the way um, the Hebrew talks about Saul. Um, it says that Saul was taller than everyone else above his shoulders. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Our, our English translations have said he was head and shoulders taller than everyone else. But the Hebrew is so, is so quirky in the way that he says it, um, that he was taller than everyone else from the shoulders up. Um, from my perspective, everyone's taller from me from their navel up. But uh, I can't do anything about that. So Saul, uh, Saul looked the part. Saul looked king. Saul had the right coif in his hair. Saul had just the right amount of gray to make himself dignified. Saul was a warrior. Saul, uh, Saul was good looking. Saul was charismatic. People followed him. He was a natural born king, except Saul had an obedience problem. And what God allowed, Saul perverted through disobedience. You see how the story goes from disobedience to humility, uh, from obedience to humility. The path there in this instance was disobedience, and there was kind of a crucible moment. I won't get into the story, but it seems when you read the story that Saul's disobedience was such a small thing. But small disobediences have profound effects in our life. And so, in a sense... God's blessing for Saul as the king was removed. It's not that God's presence was removed from Saul, though Saul, through the remainder of his life, seemed to distance himself from God's presence. Um, uh, but, but it's that, 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 that God's ordination of Saul as the king of Israel was was removed from Saul. And in fact, Samuel saw him at, at the moment of his last act of disobedience. And then scripture says right at the end of chapter 15 that Samuel did not see Saul again until he died, until, Sa until Saul died. A long absence. But then something amazing, profound, dangerous occurred. Do you know the kingdom of God is dangerous? God told Samuel that he was anointing another king. I don't know if you know this, 
I've never lived in a monarchy. Maybe some of you have. I don't think any of us have lived in a monarchy that, that is since the Magna Carta that has the kind of authority that, uh, that the monarchy of, of the Old Testament has. But, uh, um, but you, here's something you just don't do. You don't anoint another king while there is a current king on the throne. It becomes dangerous, and the, the remainder of 1 Samuel will play out some of the danger of that. But God told Samuel to anoint this other king, didn't give him a name, told him a village. He says, go to oh, the little town of Bethlehem. And on the way there, Samuel started singing, oh, little town of Bethlehem. Um, that's where that song came from. I bet you didn't know that. It's, it, it's in, it, it's in uh, 3 Samuel, so you can look for it and find it. Um, but uh, he, goes, he goes to this little town, and, um, and he was directed to a house, um, a, a man by the name of Jesse. Jesse had eight sons. Um, he was going to have more, but his wife said eight's enough. <laughs> I love groans. Groans are so much more satisfying than laughs. Um, it just it just eggs me on. But uh, um, he had eight sons, and uh, and 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 God had said one of these sons is going to be the next king of Israel. So this brings us to our story. I want to read it to you, First Samuel chapter sixteen, beginning with verse six. Here's what it says. I'm reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version today. Whatever translation you've got is okie dokie. Um, this is just the one I'm using this morning. Verse 6, it says, When they came, all of the sons, he looked at Eliab, this is the eldest, and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So think of this. Remember how Saul was chosen? He looked the part. And now all of a sudden, the first son of Jesse looks the part. Tall, dark, handsome. He's the man for the job. Even Samuel, who is in the presence of the Lord, looked at him and said, this is obviously it. Eldest son, got it all going for him. This is it. And God says, no, I measure things differently than you do. He looks the part, but he's not the man for the job. Verse 8, then Jesse called Abinadab, excuse me, and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made all seven of his sons pass before Samuel. You see what happens as soon as they start getting to the middle children. <laughs> Just stop naming them. Ah, and, then, and then all the rest came before Samuel. Now, there's no names like us middle children, neglected, poor, deprived. We have to... We have to stand up for ourselves, but that's what happened. Um, the Lord has not, has not anointed any of them. The Lord has not chosen these. Now, verse 11. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. The youngest. Now, I want you to say a word today. It's a Hebrew word. The word is katan. Can you say that? Katan sounds like a Harry Potter word. Um, uh, the, the, in the Hebrew, uh, this is the word that is put in right at the word youngest, youngest. But it doesn't necessarily mean youngest. Let me read to you an entry from the Strong's Concordance on this word katan. It says the authorized version translates this as small. This word small is 33 times, little 19 times, youngest 15 times, younger 14 times, least 10 times, less 3 times, lesser twice, little one twice, smallest once. That's all of the uses of this word in the Old Testament. Um, and so here's the, here's the cliff's notes of what, what this word means. It means young, small, insignificant, unimportant. The way Scott Daniels, a, a, a pastor, translates this word is he translates it as runt. Runt. It's 
a good translation. So I want you to see that. Um, are all of your sons here? There remains yet, Jesse said, the runt. But behold, he's keeping the sheep. He wasn't even invited. Not even invited. No one even thought of him. Yep, all my sons are going to pass in front of you. Oh, yeah, there's the other one. Forgot. <laughs> like, like, it's trying to round up your kids when you're leaving the grocery store. You just do head counts. I think we've got the right number, right? Same idea. Um, but he's out, he's out tending sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was Handsome, obviously, he looked like me. Humility, <laughs> humility, there it is. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel went up and went to Ramah. Isn't that an intriguing story. What scandal this is. What, uh, what, uh, what, uh, uh, what disruption this is. That the runt is chosen to be the king of Israel. The least, the most important, the, the, the least important, the youngest, however you, you choose uh, to translate it, the runt. When I was preparing this, I was thinking of when my youngest son, Zach, was born. Many of you have seen Zach. He is not a runt. <laughs> he is a solid dude. Like, he is solid through and through. But when Zach was born, he was almost immediately taken into NICU because he was, he was just a little bit early, and he had troubles breathing. And I was glad when they took him into the nursery because his labored breathing was, have, was making me have trouble sleeping. Because it was so loud. I was like, yeah, get that kid out of here. I am exhausted. I have just been through a lot these last 12 hours. <laughs> and so finally, finally they took Zach to the nursery. And, uh, and, and we didn't think much about it, except that later the nurse says, yeah, we've got oxygen on him. We've got these things going on. Um, and, and we said, well, what's going on? And the nurse kind of laughed. She says, well, he has what we call in the medical profession, wimpy white boy syndrome. <laughs> I was like, huh, I think I've got it too. <laughs> huh. <laughs> right? um, but apparently, apparently with Caucasian males especially, um, when they're born a little bit earlier, their lungs are the last to develop. And so he was struggling, and he spent many days in, in, that, care, in that, that facility getting care, and we had people praying for him, and, and my friend Pat, uh, who was praying, and, uh, and he was the runt. He was the runt. Um, a few weeks later, he went back into the hospital with RSV, and I remember one time Dana and I were up there holding him, and he, had, he, had all, he was all hooked up, and his breaths... He would take a breath in and take a breath out, and seconds would pass before he'd do it again. And his whole body, it was so labored, and it was terrifying. He was a runt. Um, now, the opposite has happened. Here's a boy whose hairline is like Sasquatch's, whose dancing moves are like, are like Chris Farley's. Um, he's, he is not a runt. Right? But this is what God does. God takes the smallest and God chooses the least and does the most with them. This is what humility is about. God calls the least. To all of you today with wimpy white boy syndrome or whatever, whatever diagnosis you have, whatever runt diagnosis you have, I want you to know God has chosen you. God's chosen you. God's called you. Um, and even when it seems like everyone around you has forgotten you, even when it seems like your parents, like, oh, yeah, I've got that kid, right? E even when that happens, God has chosen you. God knows you. Um, God, God, God chooses the humble. God chooses the small. Anyone that would enter the kingdom of God must do so like a child, humble himself. So there's just two things I want to pull out of this today. They're not directly from the passage. They're principles for humility. 
Does that make sense? Not verses. We're not doing an exegetical verse-by-verse look at this. We're going to pull some principles out of this, principles that belong to the kingdom of God but have been shaped by this story. Here is the first principle. It'll be on the screen. God does not call the qualified. God qualifies the called. God does not call the qualified. God qualifies the called. We've got to remember this because, uh, because so often we've got it in our head that what God wants for the kingdom of God are the people that look like Saul or Eliab or the others, the ones who have it all together, the ones who stand shoulders above everyone else, the ones who, who, who have the charismatic personality and the good looks to follow and the ones that are so talented you hate them for it because you wish you had some of it, but then you meet them and you like them and you hate them because they're so likable, because they have everything going for them. And you're like, why can't I be like that? And we look at these people and sometimes we think, well, they're the obvious choice for who God has called. And when we look at Scripture in its entirety, whether we look at the disciples or we look all throughout the Old Testament, God is always calling the runt. I love the story of Gideon. You remember Gideon in the book of Judges? Gideon was chosen. He, he, he was met by an angel while he was threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, you've got to understand, that's not how you thresh wheat. That's not how you do it. You need a wind. You need a breeze because as you thresh it and then you take the fork and you throw that wheat up in the air, the wind is supposed to take away the chaff. Right, That's scriptural language, take away the chaff, and then the kernel is supposed to fall. You need to be outside for this to happen. And Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press inside because it says he was afraid of the Philistines. And an angel shows up and says, greetings, mighty man of valor. (laughs) It's funny. That's funny. I think Gideon looked like me, like needs a tan and, and 20 more weights to, to, to lift his scrawny arms into, you know, Gideon. This was, these were the kind of people that God chooses. God calls, God does not call the qualified, I'm sorry, God does not call the qualified, God quali- qualifies the called. See, God is not looking for people in his kingdom who make sense. He's not looking for the qualified. He's not looking for the one who does everything the right way. God is not impressed with tall, dark, and handsome. His concern is the heart, and it has always been the heart. This comes as good news to us Catans, to us runts. This is good news. Um, God's first choice for his kingdom are those who are the last choice in the kingdom of humanity. God's first choice for his kingdom are those who are most unlikely to be chosen according to human standards. God chooses the least and the last. I was thinking about this this week as I was setting up a Zoom meeting that will occur in this coming week um, with, a, uh, with a preacher that I've not yet met in person, Latia Frazier. I, I, one of my goals is to get Latia to come and to preach here in late August. Um, Latia lives in Kansas City. She is a female Presbyterian minister. You're like, how do those things go together? Right? She's already behind the eight ball. She is of African American descent in a rough area who has advocated for the outcast, the impoverished, the forgotten of society. She is a spokesperson for that. Um, she, she sees the downtrodden. This is what she does. I can't wait to talk to her in person, face to face, and I hope and pray that she'll give, come to speak to you. And not only does she have all of these things against her, she also suffers from cerebral palsy. She can't drive. Um, she's, she's a Catan, but what God has done through her and with her and because of her is profound. These are the people that God 
chooses. You see, she is called, and she's not called because she's qualified any more than I'm called because I'm qualified or you're called because you're qualified. God does not call you because you're qualified, but God will qualify you when he has called you, and his qualifying is his spirit in you. I remember this moment uh, very poignantly in my life. It happened after um, we, we were interviewing for a church in Missouri Valley, Iowa. Isn't that confusing? Um, in Missouri Valley, Iowa, and, and the board was meeting. We were asked to go into the sanctuary and sit in that dark room, Dana and I, by ourselves while the board deliberated about us without us. It was horrifying. We'd gone there. I was fresh out of Bible college, fresh out of undergrad, and I had this diploma, and I thought this diploma qualified me to be a pastor. And I remember sitting in that sanctuary and a dread came over me. As, I, as they were getting ready to vote, I remember thinking, oh dear God, what have I done? I'm not ready for this. I am not ready for this. I'm not qualified. I thought I was qualified. I thought a piece of paper did that. It turns out the piece of paper is just a piece of paper. My qualifier was the Holy Spirit. You see, God calls runts. This is the first thing you need to know. Here's the second thing. The humble king is not a king, but a servant. The humble servant is not a slave, but a king. You've got to hear this. I've worked all week on this phrase. And the frustrating thing, here's, here's the katan, the runt in me. The frustrating thing is, though this was a principle in my head that I've been working with all week, I did not get the exact phraseology for this until last night when I was in the shower. Isn't that horrible? You're like, why are you telling me this? Um, because I'm telling you this to show you this is how God works in weakness. I knew it was the, the phrase at the right time. I griped to God because it came so late in the week. And so here it is, but you've got to hear this. The humble king is not a king, but a servant. If you will lead, you must serve. But the humble servant is not a slave, but a king. If you serve in the kingdom of God, you are kings and queens in the kingdom of God, princes and princesses in God's kingdom. I love the way um, C.S. Lewis says it in his Chronicles of Narnia. Once a king or queen in Narnia, always a king or queen in Narnia. It's this principle. It's the principle of service. It's the principle of humility. And it, it, it hinges upon this concept. You cannot lead if you will not first follow. Leading begins in following. Leaders sometimes forget that their job is to follow first. The worst leaders are those that have never been led. They're the worst. So this is the principle for the kingdom of God. You cannot lead if you will not follow. One of the most fam famous poems in scripture was penned by David himself. We call it the shepherd's psalm. You know this one, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear for you are with me. Right? He's leading even there. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Um, uh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows and now surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, this shepherd psalm, the psalm of David, the most famous poem in the Old Testament, that it's about following. Here's the king of Israel talking about following. Now, did David always get it right? Oh, no. Oh, no. But David was pointing with his life to the king who would get it right. You see, it was all pointing to Jesus. You see, the kingdom of God is fully entered into when we finally learn the attitude of service. Service is about following the lead of our true shepherd who served without reserve all whom he encountered. It is seen in every action of Jesus's ministry, but is exemplified in a single action that we see in the book of John. Do you remember the story in John chapter 13? 
disciples had gathered at Jesus' request for a meal. Jesus was hosting the meal, the Passover. We call it the Last Supper, right before his crucifixion. They'd all gathered there around the tent. They'd come in, in, come in with their, uh, their open-toed sandals. I know they weren't wearing socks because they followed Jesus. Uh, you don't wear socks and sandals and call yourself a Christian. And so they came in, they came in with their sandals, having walked through the dust of the paths, having stepped over uh, the, uh, the exhaust of the transportation of the day. <laughs> Maybe uh, not always stepping over, sometimes stepping through uh, in this arid climate. And can you imagine what their feet looked like? Now, it was the custom of the day that when you gather for dinner, you, of course, you would recline at the table. Can you imagine those feet? Like, Thomas, your feet, dude, seriously, get them out of my face, right? That's how it would work. And so what they would do is they would have a servant, lousy job. They'd have a servant come in. And it wasn't just the servant. It was the servant that was low man on the totem. And they had a job, and their job was, before dinner, was to come in and to wash their feet. And it wasn't just their feet, because you know how mud and dust get. It cakes on, and, 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 and so they'd be, it, it would be a nasty, dirty job. There'd be floaters in the water, right? And so they're all waiting. They're all wondering who's going to do this. And very quietly, Jesus disrobes. He puts a towel around his waist. The king of the universe, the savior of the world, the one who breathed out stars, who sees the galaxies in their hundreds of billions, each with their own stars of hundreds of billions. That God put a towel around his waist and washed his disciples' feet, all 12 of his disciples' feet, even Judas's. And he served. And at the end of that, at the end of that moment, um, it, Jesus asked him a question. Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Here's the king of the universe serving. This is what kingship looks like. This is what service looks like. Service sees a need and meets it. It is a kind of service that gives dignity to the people around you. Let me give some examples from our church without mentioning any names. Here's what this service looks like. It's the kind of service that takes the infirm to doctor's appointments. It's the kind of service that cares for the one whose memory is failing and may not remember that you ever even cared for them. It is the kind of service that teaches kids in the basement of a church week after week without anyone ever really seeing them or remembering they're there. It is the kind of service that wipes down tables after a potluck or a Wednesday evening meal. It is the kind of service that sits in a sound booth and run slides and adjust volume. It's the kind of service that plays guitar and keyboard and, and does responsive reading. It's the kind of service that sends birthday cards and text messages. It's the kind of service that feeds the hungry at the Lord's diner. It's the kind of service that plants flowers, trims bushes, and brings raspberry zingers to the pastor. It's the kind of service that prays without ceasing, that loves without boundaries, and that gives without expect, the expectation of receiving. It's that kind of service. So often we wonder where God is. It's like God has gone silent. Can I tell you, oftentimes when God has gone silent, it's because our service has gone silent as well. If you want to experience God's presence, serve. Amen. Serve. I remember in my installation service in Tabor, Iowa, almost 15 years ago, my district superintendent, Reverend, I guess, Dr. Gary Miller, came and he was installing me and we were at the altar. And one of the things he gave me at the end of that service was this towel. This towel. Not, this wasn't one for my towel closet. It's this towel. If you've been in my office, you've probably seen this towel hanging there and you've wondered, what is that? Why is there a towel hanging in your office? It's a reminder it's a reminder. This is the task of the pastor. This is the task of the Christian. This is the task 
of the citizens of the kingdom of God. That if you will be anything in the kingdom of God, you will first be humble and you will first serve. And there's such joy in that. There's such blessing in that. And I know it becomes weary and I know we wear out. But can I tell you, there is life in service. There is life in in humility. I'm reminded last of all, and this is my last story, I'm reminded of the ministry, the life and the ministry of Mother Teresa. If ever there was anyone who deserved the name Saint, it's Mother Teresa. And I'm reminded of that ministry. Um, Her high calling became that of giving dignity to the dying among the forgotten people of India. That was it. She wasn't going in to change their food distribution system. She wasn't going in to change their caste system that literally cast people away, the throwaways. She wasn't going in to make a political statement. Instead, she found these people that were dying of various diseases, leprosy and horrible diseases, and they were dying forgotten in rubbish heaps. And her one task was to go in and give dignity. So she gathered the dying. This was what she did. She gathered the dying and she treated them like human. What would they ever give back to her? Nothing. They could do nothing. But she gave dignity in dying to these people. It, 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 was, it was this. It was this that made her, uh, made her the, uh, the name that we know today. It was not because she organized a great church service or because she wrote profound theological treaties. Uh, instead, it was because she, in humility, served the least. So you're a runt. So you're a runt. You're a Catan. (laughs) You're in good company. Here's what I want you to know today. God has called you. God has called you. Uh, Notice though that his call is one of humble service, not one of degrees or qualifications or credentials or charisma. If you long for the experience of Christ in fullness, even if even in your salvation you have found that something is missing, the key is humble service to those around you. I'll finish with these words from Paul in Philippians chapter 2 when he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, and have this mind in you, which is also the mind in Christ. (laughs) That though he was in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. But the God of the universe emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant, a bond servant, and he became subject to death, even death on a cross. But therefore, God has highly exalted him and God has given him a name that is above all names and at the name of Jesus, all knees in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Of God the Father, have this mind of Christ in you, in you.